Oh, man. Well, we're going to talk about Voltron again. So, what was Voltron 2 supposed to be about? Well, unfortunately, we can really only speculate, as World Events Productions did not actually leave behind any sort of story details to where this was supposed to be. We do know that Voltron 2 was supposed to be set in a middle universe, where Voltron 1, the vehicle Voltron, was the closest to Earth. Voltron 3 was in a universe far, far away on planet Eris, which was the Lion universe, and Voltron 2 was somewhere in the middle. So the only real way to get sort of an idea of what Voltron 2 was supposed to be was to look at the actual source material that we do have, which of course is the anime which it was supposed to be based off of. That anime of course was Lightspeed Electroid, Al Vegas. <laughs> Albegas begins with a cautionary tale. The Derringer race is slowly taking over the universe, and we can see imagery from their conquests. We find out later that their next target is the realm of Earth. And Earth is pretty much oblivious to this fact. We then meet Daisaku Enjoji, a young high school student who's attending Aoba Academy, a technical school which specializes in robotics. Daisaku, being a typical youth, is brash, arrogant, and rushes off to go join his classmates at school. We find that there has been a competition, and the winners of the competition for creating giant robots are being presented in front of the entire school. In third place is Tetsuya Jin. He's a bit of a loner and has a, well, kind of punkish attitude. He doesn't really get along well with his fellow students, and it appears that his teachers aren't exactly enthralled with him either. He accepts his prize and encourages his teachers to move on. In second place is Hotaru Mizuki. She's the idol of the school. Her beauty and her resourcefulness have the admiration of all her teachers and many of the school body as well. And surprisingly, first place has gone to Daisoku Enjoji, the young man who we've met earlier. His teachers are continually calling out his name, and it seems as if he's late once again. He finally shows up in his spacecraft, which is apparently how kids get around these days, and he muts on a flashy show, entering his robot for the final ceremony and presentation. His teachers are less enthralled with him, and they go on to try and berate him. But in the distance, we can see that there are some explosions in the nearby city of Tokyo. Daisoku has seen the flames in the nearby city, and he says that he's going to investigate, and encourages Hotoru and Tetsuya to join him. The three speed off in protest of the teachers. As they arrive, the Derringer army has arrived on Earth, and they are setting up a base of operations. Daisaku and his friends arrive on the scene, and immediately start to fight the alien invasion. They do relatively well, but ultimately succumb to incredible damage and are almost killed in the battle. Professor Mizuki, Hotoru's father, has been monitoring the situation and has come to realize that the alien invasion is a true threat. He then finds out that Hotoru, his daughter, has actually been involved in the skirmish that has happened in Tokyo. <laughs> Meanwhile, Daisaku, Hotoru, and Tetsuya have taken refuge in one of Professor Mizuki's older facilities. Hotoru tells the trio that it hasn't been used in years and that they can be used freely to repair the robots. Unfortunately for them, Professor Mizuki has figured out their plan and tracked them down. He realizes that their youthful 
exuberance has gotten the better of them, but also realizes that the robots that they've created can be utilized for much more, and he agrees to help them. <laughs> Although having reflected on the attack and realizing that they are not ready for the Derringer attack, another wave of attacks begins, and the trio decide that they have no choice, and they speed off to try and defeat the Derringer one more time. This time, taking the newly designed robots from Professor Mizuki without his permission. As they attack this new force, they realize that their new robots are completely powered up. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma are incredibly strong, and they go through each and every new threat quickly. Daisaku, Hotoru, and Tetsuya now attack the main fortress, but the fortress is being guarded by an ultimate mecha, which the Derringer have built. This mecha proves to be too much for each of the three. Although each of the separate robots are strong apart, Professor Mizuki realizes that it's time for them to use their ultimate weapon. This is an incredibly risky maneuver, and Professor Mizuki prays that they'll be able to do it correctly. Professor Mizuki instructs the trio that they have to enter into the Denjin dimension. This is the key factor of their new robots, and if they do it incorrectly, it could cost them their lives. Professor Mizuki walks them through a key set of keystrokes on the keypad. Unfortunately, they have not had much practice on this as they stole the three robots without permission. So now, under pressure, they've had to find out each individual keystroke, much by luck. Fortunately, they all do it at the same time and are able to enter the Denjin dimension. In another typically amazing anime sequence, the three robots combine to form Albagus. This sets up Lightspeed Electroid, Albagus. The series itself, after having watched two of the episodes, which were available online, wow, it's very, very different than what you would expect from a typical Voltron series. The Voltron 1 and Voltron 3 had more or less uh, aligning storylines, the way it was rewritten by World Events Productions. We have Galaxy Garrison, which unifies the two Space Explorer teams. Although we can clearly see that both teams are not exactly in sync, we can recognize that because of the character designs between both of the two original series, they can sort of fit in together. Whereas Albagus, its actual character designs are very, very different compared to the two. I would actually compare it very much to a almost gonna guy type of robot series, and I'll get more into that a little bit later. The characters themselves are at an academy, which is interesting, because Galaxy Garrison is supposed to be a fully formed universal powerhouse, one which has a established military and explorers to actually find new planets that, they, that the world of Earth can actually inhabit. Whereas now we have a academy which is training new cadets, and in reality, if we look at the actual anime itself, they're actually just high school kids who are building robots for a school project. I'm not really sure how World Events Productions was going to be able to unify this, but they have done better in the past, so it would have been very interesting to see how they would have gone about it. Having watched Albegas now for the very first time, I do have to say, I actually rather enjoy it. 
It reminds me very much of another anime series which I'm very much fond of, which is Yurasei Yatsura, or Those Obnoxious Aliens, which was released by Animego. Toshio Fukuwara is the voice for both Atura Moroboshi and Daisaku, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. But they are almost identical in their character nature. Other than the fact that Daisaku actually pilots a gigantic robot, their tendencies to look up girls' skirts and go girl hunting, if you will, seems to be shared between the two characters. ああ、<笑> The series itself also reminds me very much of other giant robot series created by the legendary Gonagai. This series I'm pretty sure doesn't have anything to do with Gonagai, but the characters themselves have tendencies which parallel what Gonagai's characters would do. As a matter of fact, Goro, one of the side characters in the series, pilots a gigantic fat robot, which reminds me very much of the way Boss created his own Boss robot in Manjinga. ゴロ。Then there's your traditional Voltron combination with I'll form the feet and legs, arms and torso, and then I'll form the head. This, which is almost always voiced by Keith's voice actor, I'm not too sure it would work too well with Albegas, as there really is no other formations of the head, and they're not really creating arms and legs per se. We have very very specific three robots, moreover, combining into each other. So it would have been interesting to see how world events would have pulled that off. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this look at Voltron 2, which in the end ended up being a look at Albegas, the anime series. I have to say, it would have been very interesting to see this series come out. After all, they did produce a toy line. And it's just one of those series which would have harkened much pack into the very much beloved series of giant robots from the 1970s, which I grew up on. I really would have enjoyed seeing these characters as it would have really reminded me a lot of Star Avengers, Manjinger Z, and the Great Manzinger. Guys, thank you for joining me on this final episode of Voltron. I love this series. I love Voltron, and you guys know this. It's one of my all-time favorite series of the 1980s. I really do miss the old-school versions of Voltron. Whether it be Voltron 3, which was the Lion Voltron we were all introduced to the very early on, or Voltron 1, which was admittedly not my favorite, but still quite endearing in its own right. And then this look back at Voltron 2, which was the 
never produced series, and yet still has a mythos of its own. These three universal robots, which defended the universe and brought joy to millions of kids all over the world, resonates with so many people. And it's obvious that its appeal still holds a lot of weight as Voltron continues to be reintroduced to newer generations over and over again. I hope you enjoyed this look back at this wonderful series, and I hope that you'll join me again for more retro reviews. Guys, as always, thank you very much for watching. Geek Proud. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the link in the description below. I've got more videos on the way, and we'll see you at the next one. Geek Proud.